So I'm going to talk about um, kind of a timeline approach to packaging, how things have, have been in the past, how they're becoming today, and some predictions about how things might go in the future. And um, to keep it a little interesting, because it is all slides, not a lot of cool demo, uh, I've tried to work in some uh, tips along the way. So where, where are you now? Um, legacy repackaging, not so much of that. I mean, if you're repackaging, you're probably creating a Windows installer, I hope. Um, but more and more applications are already coming to you as Windows installer packages. So there's less need to repackage than there was long ago. Um, but now, virtualization in the picture, you have a, a new reason to package. So that, that's kind of the, the history of the whole thing is, you know, it started off that application virtualization was going to, you know, make it so you didn't have to package anymore. It was going to make it too easy. Um, you know, we know now that that did not happen. It's not going to happen. Um, Windows 8 introduces a, a bunch of new uh, technologies and ways to do things that are going to shake things up again. Uh, once again, you know, when you first hear about it, it's going to sound like, oh, this is so much easier. Now my job is too simple. Um, definitely not the case. You still have to do everything you used to do and the new stuff, and it's not easy. <laughs> uh, additional platforms, most people are having to start working with Mac and mobile devices now. And then, uh, like I said, we'll talk a little uh, I'll guess a little about what might happen down the road. So the very beginning was SneakerNet. This is the, the concept of uh, running from machine to machine with CDs to install everything. Um, most people started off like this. Uh, it took a big team of people, especially in a big company. Um, today, still something a lot of us will do from time to time for certain situations. So if it's an application that is difficult to repackage, and maybe only goes on a handful of machines. Um, you know, in those cases, walking around and installing it might not be so bad. Um, then we've got the, uh, the tips that are way too hard to read. Uh, if, you, if you have an opportunity to come by the, the case booth, uh, I've got some posters that have this information on here to hand out as well. Um, basically, every application is its own puzzle. You know, there's, there's tools like Bundle Commander that will help you try to determine what they are. Hopefully, App Deploy now, IT Ninja is a place where you can find out uh, what these different switches are. But every application is kind of its own puzzle. And it, it was the reason I, I started App Deploy in the first place was to catalog what I had found out when I realized that I couldn't find any place else to dig up those details. Uh, quick little snapshot of what it used to look like. That was back in 2000. Anybody uh, on App Deploy back in 2000? Couple people. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> cool. Um, so I'm also going to talk about a lot of tools along the way. For each of these different technologies and problems we have to solve, there, solve there's a bunch of products out there that help. Um, uh, IT Ninja is sponsored and paid for by Dell Case, but IT Ninja is product agnostic, and so um, they may not love my talking about all other products and competitive products, but that's what IT Ninja is about. Um, here we're t looking at some legacy tools. Almost all of these are dead now. Um, a AIS, that application integration suite, would later become Package Studio, which a lot of us know. Um, Picture Taker was a very popular tool, tool for a while. Um, many have used SMS Installer, which was originally a, a rebranded um, WISE product. And um, WinInstall, uh, it's, a, it's a sad story about WinInstall because that they really had an opportunity to be the repackaging tool. They were included with Windows 2000 uh, as the first MSI packaging tool, um, but they really didn't keep up uh, with the competition and um, they're trying to get it back. But um, these, these tools have, have come a long way. Most of them uh, were either, either dead through acquisition or the companies just aren't around anymore. But uh, a lot of you guys that raised your hands earlier know these tools. So then we had all our packages start turning into Windows installer packages. So now you're getting your applications as Windows installer packages. You don't have to repackage them. Um, lots of benefits and drawbacks. I know uh, most of you are very familiar with this, so I'll, I'll blow through it quickly. But um, the, the idea is, you used to have to figure out what the command lines were uh, for every application. And now, if it's a Windows installer package, you have a very consistent 
idea of what you can do. Um, it, it'll do rollback. You, you know you have uh, a bunch of silent installation options, um, verbose logging. There's um, a whole lot you can do, and it was a, a very good thing. Uh, and again, at the time, it seemed like now this is all going to be very easy. We're just going to say slash QN after every setup, and my job's done. Uh, of course, that's not what happened. That's not how it worked out. Um, so repetitive repair, if you were repackaging and you included something that didn't belong, the, the penalty was that the user was constantly told uh, it's repairing, you know, installing. It's always popping up. Um, so a new challenge when repackaging, you used to be able to include things that didn't really need to be there and it wouldn't hurt so much. Um, now with Windows Installer, it became something that you, you had to get right or it was going to cause problems for the user. Um, the uh, editing, you know, you're not supposed to edit a vendor MSI. You're supposed to create a transform. Uh, creating a transform isn't that simple. Uh, if you have the tools, a response transform can be pretty easy to create. Um, but in a lot of cases, if you need to, you need to figure out what the public properties are to do the things that you want to do. And, um, and uncovering those is another one of those puzzles. So uh, it used to be, what are the command line switches? Now it's, what are the public properties? What are the registry settings? Uh, especially with applications trying to update themselves automatically and you want to control that. Uh, it's another thing that you have to figure out for every application, what are they doing to trigger those automatic updates and how can you stop it with the deployment. Um, and then another big drawback of Windows Installer technology in general is that it doesn't update system files. So um, that means that applications like Windows Media Player and Internet Explorer and other tightly integrated applications with the operating system can't be provided as Windows Installer packages. Um, you might have seen a Windows Installer package for Internet Explorer or, or something like that before, but they're just um, Windows Installer wrappers. The, the actual work is still being done through a custom action of uh, an actual setup um, installer. Um, some tips. Don't test as an admin. I, I've seen this in a, a bunch of places uh, where they make their package and they, they run it and it looks like it's good and as an admin. And then they deploy it to their pilot group of people who are all admins. <laughs> and then when it goes out uh, in the real world and people have um, security restrictions, uh, that there can be some, some trouble. Um, it's a good idea to know uh, who the subject matter expert is on the application being requested. So if someone's coming to you and saying, I need you to deploy this application to these 50 machines or what have you, um, identify somebody, hopefully that person who's asking you is the right person, but somebody knows the application, knows how it's supposed to work. Um, different applications can have a lot of different installation options, um, optional components, and, and configuration. And you're not going to get that right just running through setup, click, 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 done. Um, that'll get it on there, but maybe not the way it needs to be. So uh, make sure you have someone who can validate success. Um, document your installation choices. So someone says, hey, where's this piece, or why isn't this working this way? You can go back and see exactly what you did. Um, not just for you to go back and see what you did, but the person who replaces you and the person who replaces them. Um, some of the packages that you created years ago may still be deployed today. Um, so some documentation for historical purposes is very important. And it's also important to document and test um, your results. So I created the package. This is what I did to say that it worked. Hopefully that's dependent on some of that information you got from the person who really knows the application. This is how I use it. I create this document. I edit this. I do this. Uh, and then you go through that for your application testing to say this package was successful. Um, and then a big benefit of documenting, because um, everybody loves to, to document everything they do, is that when you do run into a problem, you have a place to put it. So if you run up against something that gets you in trouble, hopefully that goes into your process, that goes into your documentation, and then you don't make the same mistake twice. Um, and then IT Ninja. Go there first to find out um, what others have done before you for any given application. And then I hope that after you deploy it and you've had your success and maybe learned something along the way, you go back and, uh, and share back with the community um, anything that you've learned that's worth sharing there. And here I'll take a little bit to talk about um, AppDeploy and its change to IT Ninja. 
um, all the deployment tips, the 6,500 deployment tips that, that you and, and, and others um, like yourselves have created are all there. They were all migrated. Uh, unfortunately, when we first cut over, it wasn't that easy to find everything. Uh, I see a lot of nods. Uh, we, we launched too soon, definitely. Um, so oh, six months later, the, App, IT Ninja is what I would have liked it to have been the day we cut over. Uh, we still have a ways to go. Um, there's um, search. We're still using the Google search, which isn't really doing the job for us. So we're writing our own custom search so we can completely control that experience. And um, user notifications is another big one, so that if you ask a question, you can get an email that says uh, there's been a response. Uh, I have a dedicated development team. We're doing releases every month. And um, I've got a, a roadmap, hundreds of tickets long. So it's going to be getting better and better all the, all the time. But uh, it's at the point now where um, it, it is a, a very usable site compared to what you might have seen on, on day one. Um, and, and we're still getting about 100 deployment tips a month on, on various versions of specific applications. You know, here's a registry key, here's a command line, and so forth. Um, the, the biggest page uh, that, that most of you will be interested in on IT Ninja is in the software library. So if you go to research software, um, you can see uh, the whole catalog of like 50,000 applications. Um, and then there's different ways to filter that down. So you can just see those that have deployment tips. And you can just see those that have content or just those that have content and deployment tips. So because the database is so large, um, we, we needed to provide a, a good way to, to um, narrow it down. But once you get to the page you're on, there's a, a couple things I, I want to point out. Um, up in the top, you can change what version you're on. Uh, it tries to show you the latest version by default. Um, but you might see there's 50 tips for uh, Adobe Flash Player. And when you go to the page, you only see eight tips. Uh, that could be because when you click that drop down, it'll show you the other versions and how many tips are on each of those. Because a lot of times, application deployment tips are very version specific. Um, the, the tips are all assigned to a specific version. Then throughout the site, you can follow the things you care about. So if you care about this application, you're going to be dealing with this application. You can follow it. Uh, that'll make it easier for you to find when you come back to the site later. Um, it will be something that we base email notifications on. So you can get a weekly digest of things that have been tagged with the things that you follow so that you can stay on top of um, all the applications you care about. Um, another thing is because there's actually a lot packed into this page, we're just looking at the top of it here, but there's also um, questions, blogs, links, uh, and inventory records further down on the page. So at the top here, you can get a quick look at the content that is on the page and, and jump to it by clicking, of course. Uh, we've got the difficulty ratings. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are taking the time to rate the difficulty of an application, which could be a real benefit from a community standpoint if someone comes to you and says, I need you to deploy this application. How long is it going to take? Until you take the time to actually go through and take a close look at it, you know, it could take hours. It could take days, sometimes weeks, depending on the application and what's needed. Um, so to be able to to get a quick look at how difficult your peers think it is can be very valuable um, in that initial analysis. And there's another new feature that's been added, um, something I wanted to include on App Deploy, but I didn't have developers to, to do it for me, is this notion of a deployment tip summary. Some applications have dozens and dozens of tips. Um, sometimes they repeat themselves. Sometimes they'll even contradict themselves because they're being contributed by different people in different situations. Um, but in most cases, you just want to know what's the silent install command, what's the silent uninstall command, and maybe um, some public properties or registry keys that you might need to tweak in association with the deployment. And that is um, what this is intended for, so that someone at a quick glance can see, what do I really need to know about this application? And that's a, it's like a wiki entry, so anybody can come and contribute to it and edit it. Um, moving down the page a little bit more are the inventory records. Um, this is what used to be the software knowledge base. So um, AppDeploy had a package knowledge base and a software knowledge base. 
IT Ninja merges them both into one software library. So the, on the plus side, there's now a page for most versions of most applications that you care about already. Um, if not, they're easy to add. But um, the, um, the data that was on those software knowledge page, base pages were often uh, questionable. It's really just add and remove programs information. So the, the stuff you'd see in add and remove programs in the Windows registry is what these inventory records represent. Um, so usually that's a, a uninstall command, which can be easily tweaked to be a silent uninstall command. Um, so there's some value in knowing what the GUID is. Um, sometimes you'll get the vendor. Sometimes you'll get the you know, support website. Uh, it really depends on what the vendor decided to put in their setup. And uh, of course, there's, no, there's nobody forcing them to fill out all the fields available. So the amount of information you get uh, varies substantially between applications. And then uh, closing that up, moving down the page a little more, um, there's the question and answer. So anywhere on the site, in this case, we're dealing with um, Adobe Flash Player 9. So if anyone ask, is asking a question about Adobe Flash Player 9 and they tag it with Adobe Flash or Adobe Flash Player 9, then it's going to show up here on this page. And so when you're asking a question or sharing a, a blog or sharing a link, uh, it's important to tag it appropriately because it's going to show up in more places like this, and the right people will see it. Um, some tools, you know, I said, you know, the, I want the first thing you do to be to go to IT Ninja and get the tips to save yourself time. The last thing to be to come back, share what you learned. Um, there's tools out there for uh, helping you with your process as a whole, um, with those steps and all the ones in between. Um, there's um, SparkleFlow and Workflow Manager and Packaging Robot are the, the big ones that come to mind. Um, my, my lists are not going to be all inclusive. I've tried to do this for a bunch of things. So um, if you see something missing on this or any of the tool slides, please come hit me up. Um, I'd like to keep this up to date. I'm going to be uh, re-delivering it as a webinar um, later next month. But um, the idea behind these tools is to take you through the process so that you can repeat the process and get it right every time. Make sure you follow the same steps every time uh, and help, help you along the way with documentation and um, storing your files that are associated with it. Um, MSI setups, everybody's uh, probably using one or more of these on a regular basis here. Um, a big history behind all these different tools. Um, of course, Package Studio, gone. Uh, it's uh, sad to see it go the, the, the way it did. But um, you know, it had been languishing for a long time. Um, Admin Studio has been putting a lot of work behind their tool, making it better and better. And it also uh, makes more room for other competitors to come up and, uh, and move into the space. So um, that's, that's also a good thing. There's um, the App to Play Repackager. If you go to, uh, we've got a new page on the site. If you go to itninja.com slash repackager, that's a, a short URL to get to the tool. It's a freeware repackaging tool. So it just does a before after snapshot, lets you clean up the file or registry entries that you don't want. And then it produces um, not just a Windows installer package, but also a shareable XML file or recipe file um, that you could share with others. And the, the initial idea when this was developed was to integrate it with the community so that it would be easy to share these shareable recipe files with others. Um, and now that there's development resources uh, um, dedicated to it, I, I hope that does happen in the future. But right now, you'd have to email it to someone or, or um, share it another way. But it's, you know, it is free, but it doesn't include an editor. Uh, it doesn't handle INI files in a special way. There's a bunch of things that uh, it doesn't do that the, the paid ones will get you. But it, it can be uh, what you need sometimes. Um, so next, move into virtualization a little bit. It can get confusing talking to people about virtualization sometimes because it's such a big term that encompasses so much. Even just us focused on applications, virtualization can mean many different things. So um, uh, machine virtualization, this first one, is the, the full machines running in a virtual space, like Hyper-V or ESX server. The, the whole operating system is, is virtualized on top of the hardware. 
application virtualization is um, when just the application is running locally with local system devices, but um, it, it's segmented from the operating system and, and each other. So um, there's, there's a lot of benefits in that. Most of you are familiar with them, so I won't, I won't go through it, but here we're talking about um, products like FinApp and um, AppV. And then the last one is, um, is VDI or, or terminal server desktop virtualization where the remote machine is up on the server and the user is just being presented with the um, user interface. Um, some pros on, on VDI, you know, you've got all your resources in one place. It can be easier to manage. Um, and some solutions will, will handle offline uh, caching so that you don't have to be connected to the network. But for the most part, um, it's going to be heavily reliant on, on bandwidth and uh, require a lot of significant server resources. So uh, that, that can make it an expensive solution. Uh, it's typically not good for graphic intensive applications. And um, as a result of, of kind of the, the drawbacks in general, you usually see um, big corporations investing in this technology because it's uh, rather high cost and, and also high complexity. Application virtualization, uh, definitely an easier to bite off on technology. Uh, it's portable. You get your, your separation of resources and it's running with your local system resources so you don't have to invest in a lot of um, hardware on the server side. But not all applications can be virtualized. Um, things like hardware drivers, boot time services, um, system components um, can't be virtualized today. And it's been a while, so it seems like it's definitely an inherent um, limitation of the technology um, because the application virtualization's matured, but these limitations still uh, present themselves. And, and I think uh, another big one is that there, are, there aren't any true standards. Um, you know, I had kind of hoped that AppV would be added to um, Microsoft as uh, Windows as something that was more standard, like Windows Installer, and we could get some documentation around it and some processes around it, and everyone could get on board with it. But right now, it's kind of a black box. If you're using ThinApp or, or AppV, and you run into a problem, troubleshooting it is uh, not very easy, as, as those of you trying to do so know. Um, run a little low on time, so I won't tell you about things I know you already know, like application virtualization or workstation virtualization. Uh, the, the big breakthrough here was you used to have to have 10 machines lined up constantly re-imaging themselves so that you could um, test your packages and test your deployment processes. Now you can just you know, reset to a previous snapshot in a couple of seconds. Um, application streaming, it obviously, it gets used a lot as a, uh, as a synonymous term with application virtualization, but this is really a deployment mechanism. Um, the idea being that the application isn't fully installed or maybe not installed at all until the user goes to run it and then it just gets just what it needs and starts running. Um, the drive, drive space is cheap. The benefit here is not to save drive space. Um, the idea really is the, um, that the application is, um, is more accessible for your, for your gold image. So if you have an image that you're deploying to all your systems, you can put shortcuts to um, streamed applications on there as opposed to having the applications baked into your image. Then you have to update your image all the time. Um, you can update your virtual applications on the server and then they'll be streamed as updates so that you have to go back to your, your uh, actual OS image a lot less often. Um, application virtualization packaging is, is, uh, is more forgiving in terms of not cleaning things up. So um, back to the benefits of before Windows Installer, if you include something that doesn't belong, uh, it's, it's probably not going to hurt you in this case because it's in its own space. It's not going to interfere with the system and it's not going to prevent you from doing it. Um, and a lot of the tools that you've used to create your Windows installer packages also create um, application virtualization packages, um, probably all of them, in fact. Um, some of the tools available. This is, uh, again, a list I, I have a feeling most here are, are pretty familiar with. So for the sake of time, I'll skip that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about scripting. Um, I know a lot of people that don't script, say I don't have time to script, they don't understand scripting, but it's really um, something that can make you a hero in, in your organization if you know how to do 
um, some scripting because there's problems that you can solve with a script that would take forever or, or, or longer to, uh, to fix manually. Um, batch scripts, anybody can write a batch script. Everyone probably has written a batch script. It's just commands in a text file with the right file extension. So if you get your head around that, then VB script being the, the next step is, is more complicated but still easy to bite off on. Um, and then PowerShell, I think, is probably the most daunting thing to anyone that doesn't script because it looks so complicated. Um, but my recommendation is to look at PowerShell as a really powerful command line tool and not a scripting language. Um, it can be a scripting language, but uh, by default, security won't even allow you to run a PowerShell script file. It's really designed as a command line tool for doing just about anything you can think of with the operating system. Um, but uh, I, I really highly encourage people to, to spend some time with scripting each day. And the, the most important thing really is to have a problem to solve. Um, to just say, I'm going to sit down and learn scripting is just almost impossible because where, where do you start? Uh, you really need a problem to tackle. So if there is um, you know, a registry change that needs to be made throughout the organization or um, you know, something that needs to be automated, whatever it may be, um, you know, tackle that as your project and learn what you need to learn to solve that one problem. And uh, you'll get a lot further a lot faster. Um, Windows 8 introduces a new AppX format. Um, it's, Microsoft had said uh, this was going to be, you know, installation is now just a simple X copy. You just copy the file over and, and, and you can run it. That, that was the, the promise they had been making, but um, uh, definitely not what's actually happening. Um, scripting skills, like I said, PowerShell. AppX um, is all about PowerShell. So it's a bunch of commandlets that you can run. Uh, again, think of them as command line tools. And for the most part, they're, they're very descriptive. They tell you what they do in their names. Um, you can say help after anything, get a, a bunch of uh, really good help built right into the application as well. Um, there's more detail in other sessions about uh, Windows 8 I encourage you to, to check out. Um, Mac software deployment, how many people are, are starting to support Macs uh, in, the, in their corporate environment? Most, okay, a little, little bit here and there, but mostly, mostly still Windows world. Uh, and, and it's probably gonna stay that way for most of us for a while, but you know, it really, you can't see the future, but there's um, the, this notion of a X copy install is something that, that Mac's actually been doing for a while. This a screenshot on the bottom is actually of the setup. So you, you run a file and it shows the user, here's your application, drag it into your applications folder. And that, that's literally all that's done. The user does the drag and drop as their install, and that's the end of it. Um, so the, the idea was to, to try and do similar for, for Windows initially, but you know, Microsoft likes to overcomplicate everything. Um, some tools around Mac deployment. Uh, mobile device management is the next big thing. You see more and more about user-centric um, management and so forth and all the different devices. So there's more and more devices to, to play with. Um, some tools around mobile device management. And for, for us as packagers, what this really means is more platforms is more packages. So, you know, there's, there's things that are supposed to get easier. And it's easier on the user. Their, their end user experience is definitely better. But for us as packagers, it, it really means there's way more packages to make for everything. So now you have to have a, maybe you have an executable or a Windows installer. You have a, maybe you have a virtual application that is deployed in certain instances. Um, if you have 32 and 64-bit systems, there's two more packages. Um, and then you know, Windows 8, Windows 8 RT, this new um, Windows Store interface is another type of application that you, you have to deal with. Um, so where the user is being told, you know, you want this application, you can use it in all these different places. Um, depending on how you've set up your environment, that benefit may come at the cost of you creating six or seven different packages for the same application. So uh, a little future talk in the last uh, minute or two I have left. Um, more of the same is kind of my cop-out. Uh, not, not really a prediction, so I had to come up with a, an actual prediction. And um, you, you heard a little bit about Windows to go, 
in the, in the meeting this morning. And the, the idea is on a USB stick, you can have a full copy of Windows running. Um, it, it takes about 32 gig. You, you should have a USB 3.0 drive, which not everybody has right now. So this is still pretty new. Um, to make it work, you need the, the, um, the Windows admin installation kit. You need uh, Windows 8 DVD, Enterprise, ISO, uh, a big list of command lines uh, that has to be run to get it done. So um, it's right up your alley, but not something everyone's going to be playing with. Um, and then you also need software assurance to, to make it happen uh, from a licensing perspective. But the, the benefit is that you could have your corporate image, this whole bring your own device talk that you hear all the time. Um, you don't want to get your work stuff mixed up with your personal stuff. The idea of just plugging in uh, a stick and having a whole corporate desktop that you could use and carry around with you is, is pretty compelling. So the, the, um, the future prediction uh, I, I'm making here is, is based upon that technology. So I, I think that that's going to take off as, as a way to go. Um, and then, you know, if you think about it, your, your phone is a storage device. You can plug it into your computer, put files on it. Um, a lot of them have 32 gig, maybe even free, if you haven't filled it up with movies and games. Um, so the idea of, of actually using your phone as a storage device for Windows to go is something you could do today. Um, but I think that uh, Microsoft might be in a really good uh, position with their own mobile operating system to be able to kind of tie that together. So you'd have your, you'd plug your phone into your computer and use your corporate image, but when you were unplugged, the phone may be able to allow granular security to say, you can access these files on the corporate image, or my mail on the corporate image, or my calendaring from the corporate image, as opposed to having it up in the cloud. And it's time to go eat lunch. So um, not, nothing groundbreaking you're missing. I got, I got the good stuff out. Um, supporting the cloud, there, there's an HTML5 um, um, VDI client now. So the, the idea of, of being able to use VDI in an environment where you don't have to install a bunch of prerequisites um, you know, is, is upon us. And basically, you know, the, the skills that you've developed along the way as a packager are, are going to be valuable skills for some time to come. Uh, there's some changes coming that are going to mix things up some, but you're, um, you, you're definitely going to be uh, sought after resources. And I'll, no real time for questions, so if, if you don't mind missing a little lunch, come up and talk to me. Otherwise, I'm going to be um, out on the floor and attending sessions uh, the rest of today and tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Oh, and please fill out your evaluation forms.